All right, we're going to talk this morning about pleading the blood. This is actually a request I had from a brother. Uh, this thing of pleading the blood of Jesus, you have it, you know, the people will say that they can use it to scare the devils away and you can use it for a lot of other things. I'm going to be reading an, an article here from BibleKnowledge.com. And uh, I just want to say that many Christians are kind of like this thing right here. Anybody tell me what that is? It's a parrot. You know? What's a parrot do? They repeat what they hear. Yeah. And I can tell you right now, you will be guilty of that at some point in time in your life as a Christian. Amen. You will find yourself repeating something and then all of a sudden somebody comes along and they say, uh, hey, I heard you say that. Um, is that really scriptural? And you kind of get this like blank thing in your head and you go, I don't know. <laughs> You know, and I had a guy ask ask me that this thing of pleading the blood is it scriptural? And it was kind of like, you know, I don't I don't really know. <clears throat> I mean, I've heard people say it. I've heard some actual, you know, Bible believers say it, and I <clears throat> and I was challenged on it. And I thought, I don't really know what the Bible says. So we're going to look at that this morning. And it's interesting because that's just one of the pictures there. The the parrot over here. I have the other picture. And what is that? sheep and it's kind of interesting because this is what the bible the bible doesn't call us parrots fortunately <laughs> but but the bible does call us sheep the lord jesus christ likened us to sheep now what's a sheep do a lot of times they'll follow the uh pack or whatever the the herd the herd mentality a lot of times i remember when i was little there was a pasture way back in the woods um you had to hike way back in there and i'd be walking back through just hiking or sometimes I'd be out small game hunting and there'd be this flock, not her, but like a, a flock of sheep there and one of them would see me and he'd, meh, you know, and he'd take off running and the whole flock of sheep would go taking off with him. And they never, most of them didn't even see me. But see, the one ran, so the rest ran with them. They went with the crowd. That's what the Lord likens you to as a Christian and me. We're likened to sheep. And we have to be very careful about that. There are some things that you should follow. When you see something from Scripture that's proved, you should follow it. Okay, But you always have to have that thing. Keep it in mind. Compare it with the Scripture. What does the Bible say? Go back to the Bible. So having given that as an introduction, does the Bible actually say pleading the blood? No. Does the Bible have the words plead and blood anywhere? Yes. Actually, it does. In fact, in the same verse. Ezekiel chapter 38. Turn there in your Old Testament. To Ezekiel chapter 38. We're going to see that the Bible actually does have a verse on the term, using the terms plead and blood. But it's a little bit different than what most people would think pleading the blood's about. We're going to read a couple verses here to get into context. We're going to start at verse 14. Ezekiel 38, verse 14. It says here, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwell, dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. In other words, the Lord's going to slaughter them all, and he's going to let the, the nations of the world see it. Okay? Uh, verse 17. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I will, would bring thee against them? And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. That's a bad thing. <clears throat> Verse 19, For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that are, that creep upon the earth 
and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. Now there's debate here whether this is at the end of the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, or at the end of the millennial kingdom. Okay, We're not going to get into all that, but I want you to notice the next verse. Verse 22. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. There you have pleading the blood. <laughs> and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. <clears throat> now, is that a positive or a negative reference? I think that's negative. It's very negative. You don't have Christians here pleading the blood to cast devils out. That's not what it's about. <clears throat> the only verse in your entire Bible right there that talks about pleading and blood is talking about the Lord actually bringing His wrath and His judgment and pouring it on people, and there's going to be bloodshed as a result. And if you want my honest opinion about it, I believe this is Revelation 19 is when this thing happens. Because at the end of the Millennial Kingdom, you have the these armies compassing Jerusalem, and the Lord just burns them. He pours fire on them, and they're consumed. Here you're seeing blood. You're seeing war. You're seeing battle. I believe that's Revelation 19. I believe that's what's going on there. Okay, so the only time that the, the term plead and blood appears in your Bible is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ destroying these heathen people that are coming against Israel. Now, we're going to go to the article here. I'm going to start, and there are no references in the New Testament, by the way, to pleading the blood. We're going to be looking at that as we continue. But I'm going to go to this article here at BibleKnowledge.com. And, you know, this is basically the typical thing that you're going to hear, the typical arguments. All right? How to plead the blood of Jesus for deliverance and protection. Many of the non-denominational non churches talk about the power of pleading the blood of Jesus. But they do not tell you exactly how to do it, what to plead it on, what to plead it against, and how frequently you need to do it in order to get God's maximum protection on you and your loved ones. In this article, I will show you exactly how to plead the blood, what to plead it on, some of the things that you can plead it against, and how frequently you will need to plead it in order to get God's maximum protection on you and your specific set of circumstances. I will also give you the scriptural grounds that entitles all Christians to be able to use this form of offensive prayer. Keep all this stuff in mind, by the way, as we continue. BibleKnowledge.com is what it is. I'm not sure who the author is. Um... I will also show you how to incorporate the pleading of the blood in your own personal battle prayers, which is when you will need God's deliverance and or healing power to come into any type of adverse situation that you may have just fallen into. Now, if you're a Bible believer, you're pretty much, I'm sure, catching the drift of where this is headed. Okay? Kind of getting the idea of who's writing this stuff. But we'll continue. I will back all of this up with some very powerful testimonies. We're going to get scriptural grounds, though. They said we're going to get scriptural grounds, but then it's testimonies that are going to come in, too. Involving myself and some, my, some of my personal friends and how pleading the blood of Jesus helped rescue and deliver them out of some real dire predicaments. All of these stories will be in the testimonies section of our website. The information in this article has been battle-tested and battle-proven. In my own personal opinion, I believe that learning how to plead the blood of Jesus will give you one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, form of offensive prayer. Offensive. You could say offensive, too. Um, prayer that you can use for any kind of deliverance and or protection that you may need from the Lord. Okay. Now, real quick question here before we go on to the next part of the article. They said battle prayers. Is battle prayers in the Bible? No. I haven't been able to find any. Okay. And I'm going to tie all this stuff together as we continue. Okay, the second part here. I'm jumping down a couple paragraphs in the article. 
I'm not going to read all of it. It's 14 pages long. And uh, most of it's only good for entertainment. But continuing here. Too many Christians are getting robbed, raped, abducted, murdered, sexually and or physically abused, slandered, cheated, scammed, etc. All you have to do is watch the daily news and it is one horror story after another. I believe the number one reason why so many Christians are coming under such heavy attacks from both demons and evil people in this world is because they do not have God's full protection on them. And the reason that they do not have God's full protection on them is because they have never been taught how to spiritually defend themselves using actual spiritual warfare techniques. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, I got to ask a question. The guy says here, you know, about having God's full protection on you and this bad stuff is happening, you know, including being slandered against, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, like that's that's not going to happen to you if you're a Christian, you know. I mean, give me a break. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 4 through 10. Let's see about some positive things here that'll come to you as a minister of Jesus Christ. Verse 4. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love, unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report, also known as slandering, and good report as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things." Boy, it's a shame, isn't it? Paul did not have the full power of God. <laughs> you know, he, if he would have just learned how to plead the blood, he wouldn't have had to go through all that stuff there. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, I don't think your type of Christianity is based on Scripture here, people. Romans chapter 8. You see, the charismatics have this funny notion of uh, Christianity, that it's supposed to be this wonderful, pos positive thing and you never have any hard times. And if you have hard times, it's just an attack of the devil and you can do some magic thing, you know, speak in tongues against it or you know, plead the blood on it and it, it just goes away. Well, it doesn't work that way. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hmm. You wonder why there was, a, you know, basically almost 2,000 years of Christian martyrs now? I guess, you know, for all those thousands of years, they didn't understand how to plead the blood. See, it doesn't work. You actually read through the Bible and you read what Christians are supposed to be about. It doesn't line up with this teaching of this pleading the blood thing. And, you know, let me just say, I do believe that there is power in the blood. We sang that this morning. I don't believe this John MacArthur nonsense that it was just the death of Jesus Christ and it was Jesus just had man's blood in him. That's nonsense. That's heresy. Satanic heresy. Okay? No, Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says about God has purchased us with His own blood. Jesus' blood was God's blood. There was a very holy thing there. Okay? And I do believe in that and power being in that blood to wash away our sins and to forgive all of our sins, past, present, future. But to use that as some kind of a magic talisman that you can cast it at things and, and, it, oh, you know, and your troubles go away, that's witchcraft is what it is. 
you're no different than a witch. You're casting spells. You're, you're, I plead the blood. And, and it's just like, no, just hold on a second there. You know, not scriptural. But we'll continue here with the article. We're going to go to part three here. The Jump down a few paragraphs. It says here, when the enemy does come, and he will come, at each one of us from time to time, you can either choose to run and hide, hoping that you will somehow survive the attack and make it out in one piece, or you can choose to learn how to spiritually defend yourself and engage with the enemy head on like David did with Goliath. Huh? Like David did with Goliath. Well, if we're going to fight our enemies like David did with Goliath, I don't think we're going to be pleading the blood. I think we're going to have to be armed and we're going to have to kill our enemies. Because that's what David did to Goliath. Was there blood available to even plead? Yeah, there was no blood available to even plead. The blood hadn't been shed yet. You know? Why would you compare David and Goliath to a Christian today? Well, see, the spiritual thing, there's nothing spiritual about it. They were at battle with the Philistines. Goliath comes out and he says, you know, he's blaspheming God. And David walks over and he goes, hey, buddy, I'm going to kill you. Blam, hits him in the head with a stone, falls on the ground, and he goes over and cuts his head off with a sword. Uh, I don't think I'd try that today. <laughs> you know, probably wouldn't stay out of jail too long if he did that. I'm going to go to the fourth part here. Now we're going to get into it. Scriptural grounds for pleading the blood of Jesus. There are many Christians who attack this form of prayer. They ask where in Scripture is there proof that we can use this kind of prayer for either protection or deliverance when we will really need it. There was no evidence that the early apostles ever pled the blood to heal, to cast out demons, or to get God's protection on them. That's very true. I believe there are three specific things contained in the blood of Jesus. Forgiveness, I agree with that, deliverance, and protection. Hmm. Many Christians will often know about the first one, forgiveness. They have no idea that there are two other things available to them that will enable them to live a victorious and overcoming life in the Lord while still living down here on this earth. Here's a brief discussion on each of these three things. Okay, now they go into the first one there in forgiveness. And of course, they aren't quoting the King James Version. Surprise, surprise, you know, they quote the new King James. Uh... And they, they quote uh, Matthew twenty six twenty eight and Ephesians 1, 7. We're not going to turn there. Um, but it's interesting that these Spirit-filled people would quote the New King James Version, the New King James Version with the Trichatra, the three-pointed star of witchcraft, oftentimes on the cover or in the inside of the thing. The New King James Version put together by some of the worst liberals out there, like Harold Okenga. The man it was a missionary to Africa, and he basically developed the whole neo-evangelical thing back in the 1950s. He was the one that started bringing a lot of the pagan, heathen music into the churches. I mean, the guy was just wicked, totally wicked. And he was a professor out at, at, at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary, where Rick Warren was trained. Hmm. And this is one of the guys that put together New King James. Hmm. You know, Yeah. <laughs> And they had an Episcopalian on the on the team, and they had a Pentecostal, and they had a Baptist, and they had it was like this ecumenical bunch of nonsense that got together, put the New King James out. All right, a spirit-led Christian wouldn't be using a thing like the New King James. Now we're going to go on to the fifth part here to deliverance, because I do agree with the thing of of forgiveness. The blood does cleanse you from all sin. Okay, there's no debate there. All right. The blood is there. It was shed on, on the cross. Jesus shed His blood to pay for your sins. Okay? Yeah, for remission of sins. There's no argument. Alright? I agree. Totally agree with that. Now we're going to get into the two that I don't agree with. Deliverance. And then, uh, what was the other one? Protection. protection. There you go. And when we hit protection, you're really going to see things fall apart. Alright. Deliverance. Now what are the scriptural grounds that will give us the legal right to be able to use the blood of Jesus when taking on any attacks that may come our way? As you will see in some of the stories in the testimony section of our website, you can plead the blood of Jesus against specific types of attacks such as attacks from demons or other evil people. Any kind of physical illness or disease or any kind of addictions like drugs and alcohol. 
Many Christians are not aware of this second com component that is in the blood of Jesus, which will enable us to be able to use his blood to go on the offensive against any adversity that may come our way. Something else that uh, something else happened that day when Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins. The Bible tells us that Jesus also defeated Satan and all the powers of darkness that day. Here are several good verses from Scripture proving this point to you. All right. Uh, let me ask a question here before we continue. Did Jesus defeat Satan at the cross? In what way? <laughs> in what way, yeah. Yes, in terms of death and, and everything like that and people going to, to hell and all that, you know, as far as the thing of having to go down to Abraham's bosom and all that. Yeah, he did triumph over him. But the point is, Satan is still the god of this world. And the majority of people are still going to hell. So you can't say, Satan's a defeated foe, you know. Well, in terms of salvation, yeah, you know, somebody gets saved, he has no power over them to send them to hell or anything. But he hasn't been defeated in this world. It's not true. Now they quote a couple of verses here. I'm just going to read down through them because we have a lot to cover. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Okay, that's one of the proof texts there. And, you know, as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. In other words, Jesus Christ came here in flesh and blood. That's what it's talking about there. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Colossians 2.15 And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. 1 John 3.8 He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth against, or from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay? So in other words, what this guy's doing is he's taking verses that talk about forgiveness of sins by the blood, and then he says... The devil's defeated from another verse, and you're supposed to link the two together. You know, like the, you can use the blood to defeat the devil. And it's like, no, no, it's crooked, you know. Uh, and then finally, Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Wow. So they overcame him by the blood, and it's like, Wait a second, but they love not their lives to the death. I thought the blood was supposed to be there to protect us from evil people. Um, not a good proof text. It actually proves the exact opposite. You can overcome the wicked by the blood of the Lamb, but you're going to end up getting killed for it, as we read back there in Romans chapter 8. That doesn't prove the point there this charismatic's trying to prove. That's actually the opposite. Okay, continuing on here. Now it starts getting interesting. Notice in this verse, uh, oh, and then it goes on here. Um, Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 19. It's important to see this here. Because they go from the thing of, of uh, showing things, you know, the verses that we just read, and they say, well, see, you know, Satan's a defeated foe, and we have the blood, and you know, so we can defeat him with the blood. They go from that to now trying to steal verses. They just jump all over the place, taking verses out of context. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notice in this verse we have God's power over all the power of our enemies, not just against some part of their powers. This means we have the ability to come out completely victorious in some of life's battles and struggles. What? But only if we learn how to properly use what is available now to us. Okay, a couple points need to be made here. First of all, there are no Christians here in this passage. This is Jesus Christ appointing 70 disciples to go out and basically do signs and wonders. This isn't for you as a Christian, okay? But he says here, we have the ability to come out completely victorious in some of life's battles. 
Well, if we're completely victorious, shouldn't it be in all of life's battles? Because if it's only in some, then you're not completely victorious. <laughs> yeah, okay. But it's interesting. Go up to verse 17 and 18. We'll see who this is written to. And the seventy return again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He's not writing to Christians. He's writing to Jews. Okay, that's who he's speaking to. Okay? Uh, but let me just make a point here in verse 17. Lord, even the devils, devils are subject unto us through thy blood. Is that what it says? No. It says through thy name. Hmm. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Isn't it interesting that a lot of modern Christians are forsaking the name of Jesus? They'll talk about Christ or the Christ or the one, you know, and it gets even worse from there. And a lot of them too are going with this whole Hebrew thing. And they'll get you to say Yeshua. And then they'll say Yahshua. And then they'll go Yahashua. Yahashua is Joshua. It's not Jesus. So you'll have these people, they'll start you out with Yeshua, and then they work you over to Ye Yahashua. They're getting you to say that you're saved in the name of Joshua. You're not saved in the name of Joshua. It's the name of Jesus. Interesting. The power there is in the name of Jesus. And we're going to see about that later too. Okay, now the next one here. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. We'll turn back there. This is another one that they're going to quote to try and prove this whole thing, pleading the blood. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Okay, they say here, notice in this verse that Jesus gives the twelve apostles power over all demons, not just some of them. If we have God's power available to us to defeat all demons, then I believe that we also have God's power to defeat any and all humans who may try to come against us with any type of unjust action or attack. Okay. See the, the absurdity of this thing? I mean, were the martyrs wrong? <laughs> All those martyrs that were executed for the faith? You know, it, it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Daniel chapter 11.32. I'll just read this one here quick. Um, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. They leave that part out. But then they say, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Okay? And they say here, knowing their God means that we have spent good quality time in establishing a good personal relationship with the Lord. If we do this, then this verse is telling us that God will strengthen and empower us when we need His power to be able to carry out great exploits and great adventures for Him. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, it goes back to the book of Daniel and says, this is for us today, you know. See the mess people that are non-dispensational get themselves into? You know, it's bad. Second Corinthians chapter, or yeah, Second Chronicles. Chapter 16, verse 9. Another verse for us Christians today. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Uh, herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. You know what's interesting? In the article, they only quote the first part. They leave out, here and thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, why'd you only quote the first part? You know, he was rebuking them. But see, they just want to steal that first part. Here's what they say. This verse is telling us that God is actually looking for people that he can anoint with his power and show himself strong through. But the implication appears to be that he really can't find many people who are willing to pay the price to be able to really walk with his anointing. As you can see from the way all, from the way all of the above scripture verses are worded, true Christianity. They didn't quote one verse pointed at Christians. Not one. The Gospels and the Old Testament. 
pre-crucifixion, every verse that they quoted, and they say true Christianity is not a weak, wimpy, or passive religion. As born-again believers, we all have the Holy Spirit li literally living on the inside of us. Now that's true, but then they take it and they mean it to say that you can do all this miraculous power stuff. And they steal verses from the Old Testament from another dispensation and try to apply it to today. It just doesn't work. It's crooked. Now, if you want to see, let's talk about some true Christian power. Turn back to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. You want true power, true spiritual power? I'm going to show you how to get it. And we're going to see seven different things in these verses. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Here you have the most powerful Christian that ever lived. Paul writing, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I, might, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now look at this, verse 10 here. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Boy, isn't that nice? Continue reading. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. You want power? Right there it is. Let's look at seven different things here. First of all, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Self-sacrifice. You're going to have to sacrifice some things if you want to be spiritually powerful as a Christian. And you're going to see later on in this article, that's not what they're teaching. They're teaching that you can plead the blood and throw the blood at any kind of adverse situation, any kind of thing at all, and protect everything you have. You aren't going to believe what they say later on here. It's crazy. Uh, the second thing that you're going to see there. Um, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Knowledge of Scripture. You say, well, I can know Jesus Christ outside of the Bible. I just want to have the experience and feel. No, you can't. You can't know Jesus Christ out of this book. This book is the most precious possession you have, that any of us have. So knowledge comes you know, there as well. Self-sacrifice, knowledge of Scripture. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I, might, that I may win Christ. What's that? Well, counting the respect of the world as dung. Paul was a very educated man. And he looked at all that education that he had being trained by the learned, you know, Dr. El, or, uh, Gamaliel and all that stuff. You know, he was a, um, a Pharisee, according to law, you know, blameless and all that other stuff. And he looked at all that, those credentials that he had that would have entitled him to walk around in the long robes and the greetings in the marketplace and all that stuff that Jesus condemned. And he said, that's all dumb. And I'll tell you something, any man of God that's out there that's gone through seminary and that has all of his PhDs and THDs, if they ever do anything for the Lord, they have to look at all that education and say, that stuff's dumb. There are very few Bible colleges, Bible seminaries that will train you the right way. Most of these guys that get out and are doing something for the Lord, they say, man, I can't believe the stuff I was taught back there. That stuff's dumb. Nothing. And a good preacher that's PhD, you'll never even know it. They'll just say, oh, my name's, you know, Pastor Mike or something like that. And later on, you know, there there is a Pastor Mike that we know, Mike Collingwood. Yep. And he has a PhD. You'd never know it. He doesn't call myself, oh, I'm the Dr. Collingwood, you know. Nope, he doesn't do that. Just a regular guy. Good man. These guys that are going around throwing around their, their honorary degrees and stuff, Bad. Uh, continuing here, verse 9, And be found in Him not having mine own righteousness. No self-righteousness. Understanding that you're a sinner, saved by grace. Okay, Being humble. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Okay, Humility is also there. All right, Which is of the law, uh, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. 
So you have to have righteousness by faith. Okay, the just shall live by faith. So that comes in too as another thing that you need. Now continuing down here, we'll jump down. The fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Okay, you have to have some fellowship of Jesus' sufferings. The things that he was attacked for, the things that he was mocked for, you better be going through the same thing as a Christian. Okay, and what about taking up your cross and dying daily? Yeah, presenting your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Okay? You want spiritual power, that's how to get it. Self-sacrifice, knowledge of Scripture, counting the respect of the world as dung, no self-righteousness, be honest about being a sinner, righteousness through faith, okay? You have to have faith, fellowship of Jesus' sufferings, and taking up your cross daily and dying to the world. That's the key to spiritual power, not some pleading the blood thing that has no basis in Scripture. All right? Just the way it is. We're going to go on here to part 7. And we're going to start seeing here the old uh, charismatic prosperity gospel start to rear its ugly head. Here we go. <laughs> Protection. Okay, we had the deliverance one there, which he bombed out on. He couldn't prove that. Protection. You're going to spot something here quickly. As you will see in the next section, you can also plead the blood of Jesus on specific things that you will want protected before any kind of adversity could strike them, like your body, house, car, and finances. <laughs> the goal is to plead the blood of Jesus on those things in order to protect you before any kind of adversity could ever come your way. What did it say there about the sufferings of Jesus, you know? Fellowship of his sufferings, but I want to be protected by the blood before sufferings come. Doesn't the Bible say if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him? Amen. Oh, I don't want to suffer as a Christian. Mm. Well, guess what? You're not going to reign. <laughs> okay? To be able to reign with Jesus in the millennial kingdom, you're going to have to suffer. Have the fellowship of his sufferings. Go through what he went through. What these people are doing, they're taking away millennial inheritance from people all right part eight and they go over the thing about the passover there and it says uh here's my argument on this if the shed blood of the old testament lambs used for the temporary covering of sins eventually leads to the shedding of jesus's blood for permanent and total forgiveness of all our sins see that's true they use truth they bait you in with truth and now comes the lie can we also use that same analogy and say that the shed blood of the lambs used in the Passover for divine protection could also lead to the shed blood of Jesus having divine protection in it? I personally believe the answer is yes, and that is why God the Father seems willing to work with any believer who will plead the blood of Jesus, you know, he seems, you know, seems, possibly, maybe, you know, <laughs> uh, who will plead the blood of Jesus on whatever they want to protect, protection on before any attack can come their way just like he did in the story of the Passover with his own chosen people. Uh, in other words, what they're trying to say here is, God told the Jews back there in Egypt before they left Egypt, he said, you know, take a lamb, a perfect lamb, kill it, sacrifice it, take the blood, put it up here, and on the two sides, you know, kind of like the cross, you know, and then when the death angel comes through, he will pass over your house. That's why they call it the Passover. Okay, but the interesting thing is, who sent the death angel? God did. It wasn't some bad thing that was coming and they had to put the blood up to protect them. So, no, it wasn't that. God was saying, hey, I'm going to judge, and if you don't want to get hit by this judgment, you better shed some blood and put it there and there and there. See? You can't take that story and apply it to a, a Christian today protecting themselves from evil people or from a bank holiday or something. I mean, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Continuing on. Zipping down through this article here. Quote, This lack of a full surrender to God the Father is what is... Oh, and, and they, they uh, go through the full surrender thing here then. Um, yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, this lack of a full surrender to God the Father is what is getting so many Christians beat to a pulp in the playing field of life. They do not have God's full protection on them. 
and as a result, they are coming under severe attacks from demons, evil people, and just some of the natural calls and effects that can occur at a moment's notice, such as different kinds of accidents, catastrophes, mishaps, and illness that can hit any one of us at any time. Paul didn't have God's maximum protection, I guess. Without God's maximum protection, any one of us can get hit by these types of severe storm clouds. Only God's divine protection can keep you safe and out of harm's way from some of these types of storm clouds. And the only way to get God's maximum protection on you and your life is to come under this full and complete surrender with Him. If you want to take this last and final step with the Lord, then I can give you a very short but powerful prayer to go to God the Father with to come into this full surrender with Him. This prayer should be said at least once or twice a year after you do it the first time. You need to show God that you mean serious business with Him on this, and by continuing to recite this prayer back to Him on a once or twice per year basis, you will be showing Him that you are really serious about this full surrender, and, you will, uh, and that you will continue to let Him have full control of your entire life for the rest of your earthly life. Good English there. Entire life for the rest of your earthly life. No, they give a prayer out for free. Don't worry about that. But uh, um, what does the Bible say about repetitious prayer? Watch out. Yeah, vain repetitious prayer. But watch out for this thing of here's an official prayer formula, and you need to say it so many times a week or so many times a year or whatever. That's Catholic. That's liturgy. Yeah. Liturgical. You know, the the Sunday missile that you get as a Catholic. You know, and you can go in there and you can pray your special little prayers and it gets you time out of purgatory and stuff. Look out for that. Yeah. You know? Dangerous stuff. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 11. Turn there. Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23. Now remember there it said that if you're fully surrendered... The Lord will protect you from catastrophes and all kinds of good stuff. Let's continue. Verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measures, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. In other words, his life was, he almost died a couple times. Mm -hmm. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. Isn't that something? He doesn't say, well, bless God, we had 3,000 people saved last week at the revival meeting, and we had 50,000 people in Sunday school last week, and our giving, the offering was way up from last you know month or something, and we're looking to build this big building, and we're going to build a seminary next to it. And He isn't doing that. He's not glorying in those things. He's glorying in his infirmities. He's going, hey, check this out. Look at it. You know, pulls his shirt up. Look at all them stripes. Isn't that great? <laughs> you know, yeah, you know. Look at look at that. I lost that finger over there in one battle and stuff. Yeah, in this this thing over here. I remember this time I uh, shipwrecked and I was out there in the ocean. There were sharks swimming everywhere. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> How contrary that is to the modern prosperity gospel, to the modern charismatic. Oh, God's going to just work everything out for you. You'll never have to suffer. See? Just totally contrary to it. That's how you can know this whole pleading the blood thing is just, it's not of the Lord. I'm real sorry. Continuing on here. Uh, let's see, where am I at here? Uh, it says here. <clears throat> The basic things that you will want covered under the blood of Jesus for His divine protection are the following. Number one, your body, soul, and spirit. Number two, your house. Number three, your car. Number four, your finances. Number five, your office, if you work. 
<laughs> Number six, your spouse and children if you are married. Any one of these could come under demonic or human attack at any time. Pleading the blood of Jesus on your car will help you or help prevent you from getting into any type of serious auto accidents. <laughs> Along with helping to prevent any type of break-ins or thefts of your car. <laughs> wow, that's pretty handy. Pleading the blood of Jesus on your finances will help protect you from all the scammers and con artists who are out there trying to scam and steal all of your hard-earned money. I'm not making any of this up, by the way. I'm reading the article. Okay? BibleKnowledge.com is what this thing is. Bible and then a slash and then knowledge.com. Um, identity theft has become a major problem in our country. Pleading the blood of Jesus in all, on all your credit cards and bank accounts will stop thieves dead in their tracks if they try and target you for identity theft. Pleading the blood of Jesus on your house and office buildings will help protect you against fires, break-ins, burglaries, natural cat catastrophes, or any type of bad accidents. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, pleading, the blood of, uh, pleading the blood on all of your children will help protect them from any possible abductions, serious accidents, or life-threatening illnesses. I do not have to tell you how many sexual predators there are out there looking for their next victim. Literally, a day does not go by when someone is not getting abducted, robbed, raped, or murdered. Pleading the blood of Jesus on your own body, soul, and spirit will also help keep you personally protected from all of the above. I could go on and on with the number of bad things that could either could ever happen to you, uh, your children, or your spouse. Bottom line, only God knows when any attack will be coming your way, and only God can protect you, and or protect and shield you from these attacks before they do come. And the way that you can get God to move in with his full divine protection before any of these attacks can come your way is by pleading the blood of Jesus on each of the specific things that you want that you will want protected. Yeah. Okay. Um I mean, you know, why not carry a, a lucky rabbit's foot in a four-leaf clover too? I mean, hey, you know, it couldn't hurt, you know. <laughs> Give me a break. You know, read your horoscope and, you know, go out and live by the stars or something. What is this? It's witchcraft. It's witchcraft. It's occultism. Yeah. It's lucky charms. It's enchantment. It's sorcery. That's all this is. All right? I mean, who ever heard pleading the blood of Jesus on your car so it doesn't get in an accident? I mean, come on. And the guy actually goes on to say later on in the article that if you have to fly somewhere, before you step onto the airplane, you're to plead the blood of Jesus onto the airplane. Okay, you know, yeah, all right, continuing on here, frequency, how often do you have to do this? How often will you have to plead the blood of Jesus on all of the above in order to get God's maximum protection on these things? Through personal trial and error with the Lord on all of this, I have found out that in my own personal opinion, or in my own personal life, that I have to plead the blood of Jesus on all of the above items on a once per month basis. Wow. Okay. So once a month you repeat a, a repetitive prayer. Hmm. Interesting. Next part here. Quote. I have personally found out the hard way that if I want God's full protection on all of the above items, that I have to plead the blood on the night before the beginning of the next month. Isn't that interesting? In other words, if I want God's protection for the month of May, then I would have to plead the blood of, on all of the above on the last day of April. I have been burned several times when I forgot to do this and was subjected to several abnormal attacks on the first day of the, of the next month. It would be like a football player forgetting to put his helmet on for even one play. Not having his helmet on for even that one play could get him killed due to the intensity of the game that he is playing. Yeah, it's a game you're playing, all right. I agree with that. But think about something. you got to pray on the eve of the end of the month. So what would you do in October? Yeah. Hmm. Halloween is your magical day of prayer that you recite your repetitive prayers and put the blood on all kinds of things, you know, and on your wallet and each one of your credit cards and your car and your house. I mean, that's what, that's what the guy said in the article. I'm not being sarcastic. He said on each one of your credit cards and your bank accounts. 
what the guy said. See, you're not dealing with, with sane, rational Christianity here. And that's what a lot of these people are, are teaching, by the way, too. And it gets worse. We're going to keep continuing here. Yeah, can it get worse? Yes, it can. The next part, and then here's where it really gets interesting. Applying a bloodline. Here's another thing that you can do, especially for those of you who own a house and property surrounding it. You can walk around the entire property pleading the blood of Jesus as you walk completely around it in a circle. What you are doing is applying a bloodline around your property. Um, I've, that's in there somewhere. I think it's maybe back in Ezekiel or Acts or something. I, you know, I couldn't remember reading about a bloodline there. Continuing here with the article, I have read of cases where Christian farmers have done this to protect their livestock and flock from attacks from wild predators. In one case in particular, a farmer was having a problem with some of his farm animals being killed by a wild wolf. He went ahead and applied a bloodline around his entire property. When he woke up the next day, he found a dead wolf lying about two feet past the point where he had just pleaded the blood over the day before. In other words, the wolf had crossed over about two feet into the farmer's territory and had crossed the bloodline. The wolf was stricken dead as soon as he crossed the bloodline. The farmer had no more problems with any of his animals being killed after that one wolf had been struck down because he was made an example, you see. And the other animals are smart enough to see, you know, oh, that was the bloodline. Hey, I, I warned him, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, what are we going to deal with? Leprechauns here jumping up and, you know, rainbows and pots of gold and, you know, you know, Cooksville. Pleading the blood and applying a bloodline around your house and property can also help protect you from earthquakes or tornadoes. There have been documented cases out in California where some Christian families had pleaded the blood over their houses and property. An earthquake had then hit the entire area. All of the houses in their subdivision had sustained some type of damage from the earthquake, but there was no damage whatsoever to the houses that had pled the blood of Jesus on them by the Christian families. Now, notice something that he said. There have been documented cases. Where are they? Oh, oh, well, you know. <laughs> and we're going to see later about this documented cases thing. Okay? And again, what about the Christian martyrs? What about the Waldensian people that were basically completely wiped out by the Catholic Church? Because they would not bow, they would not bend, they would not submit to the Catholic Church. And they fought and fought and fought over the centuries with the Catholics, and finally the Catholics just killed them all. Sending in troops of thousands against a small village of people. You know? And going in and doing things that are just too horrible to even mention to those people. Where's this stuff at? For thy sake we are killed all the day, all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. The Waldensians fulfilled that scripture. This nonsense here has nothing to do with that. See? It's just ridiculous. And then you get into trains and planes, just like I said. Before you get on a train, before you get on a plane, you plead the blood on it, you know, and, and then, you know, you'll be protected. And I guess if there's an accident or something like that, the whole rest of the train will blow up or the plane and, and your like seat you know will be perfectly fine, you know. <laughs> something. <laughs> yeah. Alright, uh continuing on here. We're almost done with this article. You have to endure to the end. <laughs> yeah. Uh if you're listening online and you need to, you know, rush to the bathroom to you know Spew, as the Bible says. Uh, continuing here. Uh, just pause the thing. Uh, another part here. Um, these verses are talking about the signs and wonders that the early apostles walked with. These verses are specifically telling us that all the signs and wonders that were done by the early apostles were done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now watch. See? These people will do this over and over again. They will tell you the truth, and once you say... Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then they come in with the lie, just like Satan did. You know, that's, what, that's the way they do this. Continuing here. And if we have the same Holy Spirit that the early apostles did, then we too are capable of having God manifest his power to us through the Holy Spirit like he did with them. The Bible tells us that God is no respecter of persons, which means that he will do 
for one, what he will do for one, he will do for another. See? So they come in and they say the early apostles did things by the power of the Holy Spirit. Truth. And we too have that same power. Lie. They mix it together. When the Spirit of truth has come, He will lead you into all truth. Okay? This nonsense, we have the Holy Spirit, we're preaching the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is manifested on us, and then they're lying? Satan is the father of lies. Yes. Be careful about that. And I'll tell you what, the reason that these people are so successful at deceiving huge multitudes of people, and we're going to see about some of this deception here in a minute, the reason they're so successful is because people don't know the Bible. If you know this book, you're not going to be deceived as easily. Okay, You can still get deceived even if you know the book. Now, then he goes on to the thing of personal testimonies. A section of our website. And he says here, Due to the very personal nature of many of these testimonies, I will not be releasing names of the actual people involved. Wow. But I'm sure you know they're documented. And by the way, let me just say this before we, we're just about done here. Let me say this. I do believe that some of these charismatic things, I do believe most of it's fake. The majority of it is fake. They plan it you know, behind the scenes and they, and they bring out the people. I mean, there's documented cases of that. Jim Jones was doing it. He had one of his secretaries, I have that in one of my videos, had one of his secretaries, an older woman, come out. They brought her out in a wheelchair, you know, and, and he said, stand up, you know, by the power of the Holy Ghost or something. And, Jim Jones is Pentecostal, by the way, as well as a Jesuit. And he told her to stand up, and she stands, you know, and everybody's going wild and all this. The whole thing was fake. And they do that a lot. But honestly, I do believe that by the power of Satan, they can actually heal. Yeah. Okay? You read back there in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh's magicians were doing a lot of the miracles, repeating a lot of the miracles that, you know, Moses was doing. Moses and Aaron. Okay? So you've got to watch out for that whole thing of signs and wonders. Now the conclusion of the article here, he recommends three books. Power of the Blood by H.A. Maxwell White. Don't know anything about him. The Blood and the Glory by Billy Brim. Don't know anything about him. The Word, the Name, the Blood by Joyce Meyer. <laughs> I know plenty about her. <laughs> I like to call her... Uh, Butch Meyer. But uh, just want to read something here quick about the great pastor, Joyce Meyer. Joyce Meyer used to travel in this Canadier Challenger 600S seen here in Sydney, Australia, when she is, was a special guest at the Hillsong Conference in July of 2005. It has been replaced by a Gulfstream 4. Okay? $10 million airplane she's flying around in. Meyer, who owns several homes and travels in a private jet, currently a Gulfstream 4, has been criticized by some of her peers for living an excessive lifestyle. She claims that she doesn't have to defend her spending habits because, quote, there's no need for us to apologize for being blessed. I bet you she pleads the blood on her finances and everything. It's not the blood of Jesus. by devil's blood. Meyer commented, quote, You can be a businessman here in St. Louis, and people think the more you have, the more wonderful it is. But if you're a preacher, then all of a sudden it becomes a problem. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, obviously. And uh, she's not a preacher. Mm. On November 11, 2003, the St. Louis, St. Louis, St. Louis, however you want to say it, Post-Dispatch published a four-part series exposing Meyer's $10 million corporate jet her husband's $107,000 silver gray Mercedes sedan, her then $2 million home and houses worth another $2 million for each of her four children, her $20 million headquarters furnished with $5.7 or $5.7 million worth of furniture, artwork, glassware, and the latest equipment and machinery, including a malachite round table, a marble-topped antique commode, <laughs> which was heated, by the way. A custom office bookcase. Now pay attention to this next one. A $7,000 Stations of the Cross in Dresden Porcelain. Stations of the Cross. What's she doing with a Catholic Stations of the Cross? Yeah. Worth $7,000? Can you say, 
Jesuit? Yeah. Hmm. You know, I wish, I've often wished this, and I'm probably never going to get it, because if I did, I'd probably get killed, but I often wish I had a list of who the Jesuits are. I bet you'd be shocked. I bet you some of the biggest names out there, some of the guys that you think, oh, they're, well, maybe they're just a little off doctrinally or whatever. I bet you a lot of them are Jesuits. And you study it, a lot of them are pushing the teachings, the core doctrines of Catholicism. Yeah. All right? It's bad. Continuing here, an eagle sculpture on a pedestal, another eagle made of silver, and numerous paintings, among many other expensive items, all paid for by her ministry. The article prompted Wall Watchers, a Christian nonprofit watch, watchdog group, to call on the Internal Revenue Service to investigate Meyer and her family. Following the adverse publicity about her lifestyle and Ministry Watch's request for an IRS probe, Meyer announced in 2004 plans to take a salary reduction from the $900,000 per year she had been receiving from Joyce Meyer Ministries in addition to the 450000 her husband received. you got to love that. A little bit of feminism there, you know. Yeah. Her husband's making half of what she makes. <laughs> Anyhow, and instead personally keep, uh, keep more of the royalties from her outside book sales, which Meyer had previously donated back to Joyce Meyer Ministries. She now retains royalties on books sold outside the ministry through retail outlets such as Walmart, Amazon.com, and bookstores. While continuing to donate to her ministry royalties from books sold through their conference, conferences, catalogs, website, and television program. The net effect of all this, notes Ministry Watch, was more likely a sizable increase in the personal compensation of Joyce Meyer and reduced revenues for her ministry. In an article in the St. Louis uh, Business Journal, Meyer's public relations director, Mark Sutherland, confirmed that her new income would be way above her previous levels. Joyce Meyer Ministries says it has made a commitment to maintain transparency in financial dealings, publish their annual reports, have a board majority, who are not Meyer relatives and submit to a voluntary annual audit. Currently, this ministry is receiving a C rating, 81 through 90, in financial transparency from Ministry Watch. Just a little bit more to read here. On November 6, 2007, United States Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa announced an investigation of Meyer's ministry by the United States Senate Committee on Finance. Grassley asked for the ministry to divulge financial information to the committee to, to determine if Meyer made any personal profit from financial donations, asking for a detailed accounting for such things as cosmetic surgery and foreign bank accounts, inciting such expenses as the $23,000 commode mentioned earlier. <laughs> he also requested that Meyer's ministry make the information available by December 6, 2007. In her November 29th response to Grassley, Meyer notes that the commode is a chest of drawers. Okay. Meyer writes that it was part of a large lot of room items totaling 262000 that were needed to furnish the ministry's 150,000 square foot headquarters purchased in 2001. She said the commode's price tag was an errant value assigned by the selling agent and apologized for not paying close attention to specific assigning values placed on the pieces. The investigation also aimed to scrutinize five other televangelists, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Eddie Long, Paula White, and Creflo Dollar. Make a dollar, yeah. Joyce Meyer Ministries responded with a newsletter to its email list subscribers on November 9, 2007. The organization referred to its annual financial reports, asserting that in 2006 the ministry spent 82% of its total expenses for, quote, outreach and program services toward reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, as attested by the by independent accounting firm Stanford, Stanfield and Odell LLP. The message also quoted on an October 10, 2007 letter from the Internal Revenue Service which stated, We determined that you, Joyce Meyer Ministries, continue to qualify as an organization exempt from federal income tax under IRC Section 501C3. The same information was also posted to the ministry website. Who says crime doesn't pay? And if that's not bad enough... Had a brother send me this last night. Pay per view Jesus. Two guys. Joel Osteen is now charging $147 for front row seats at his services. 
$147 to have the seats right there in front of where the guy stands. Boy, that's spiritual. And then, pay-per-view here, Dr. Miles Monroe is hosting a conference in which the pay-per-view charge is $199. You know, pay-per-view, WrestleMania, and boxing events, and all this secular stuff, right. and now it's going to be preaching, too. Incredible. And here's the flyer for it. I kind of have it messed up here. It's printed partly here and partly on the other thing. It's the November 6th through the 10th. I, hey, we still have time to watch it, I guess. November 6th through the 10th, 2011, MMI Global Leadership Summit. Yeah, I love that. Global Leadership Summit. And what are they going to be teaching? For the serious leader dedicated to personal development, corporate competence, and national interest. They're going to be talking about corporate leadership. Now, what have I been saying all along here? 501c3s are a corporation. And the pastor, the quote-unquote pastor, is the CEO of the corporation. And they're having things saying that we are going to teach you how to be a corporate leader. See, it's getting so wicked and so evil that they are now just openly saying, yes, we are Jesuits. Yes, we are using Catholic Bibles. Yes, we are stealing money from you. Yes, we are, are living luxurious lifestyles while you people, a lot of you are unemployed. And we just keep stealing your money. Yes, we are corporate leaders. Yes, you know, it's all true. And the people are so deceived and so dumbed down that they're just going, I don't believe it. Here, can I give you more money, you know? Can I, can, where do I sign up? And you have these modern churches that are putting in ATM machines and giving their people cards. And you can come in and you can scan your card and give money to the mega corporation. It's insane. I mean, it's just like everything that we've been saying, that Bible believers have been saying, the conspiracy-minded Bible believers, it's all coming to pass. It's all happening right before your eyes. Just insane. Finally, it says here, it says, uh, 21st Century Global Leadership Round Table Discussion. Now, if you know anything about the Council on Foreign Relations, they talk about the round table discussions. Right. And Rick Warren openly, openly, I mean, the guy's on YouTube saying it, I'm a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. It's insane. I mean, it's, it's just like the Antichrist will come and these guys are just going to be like, oh, this is the Antichrist. Yeah, we worship him. We've been setting the stage for him. And people are going to go, Ah, uh, you know, it's wonderful. Bad. Now we're going to talk about some spiritual warfare in the Bible. We're going to hit a couple passages and then we'll be done. Matthew chapter 4. What would be the greatest type of spiritual warfare that you could possibly encounter? That anybody could possibly encounter? Facing Satan. Manifest right there before you. I don't mean figuratively the devil tempted me to do... I mean, I'm talking about he appears and he's physically right there. Did anybody ever go through that? Yeah. We're going to read about it right here. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, I plead the blood against you and I rebuke you, Satan. No, he didn't say that. Read your Bible. Your Bible says in verse 4, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Are you living by the word of God? Is this book part of your mind? Is it part of your speech? Did you know that if you ever encountered the devil, like some of these charismatics think they will, the best thing that you can do is use this book? I mean, who, who more than Jesus Christ could have pled the blood? He had the blood. <laughs> he had all the blood within it. Why didn't he use it? He used the book. Isn't that amazing? Verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, like this, for it is written, 
he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now if you go back to Psalm 91 verse 11, we're not going to go there, but he actually, that's what Satan's quoting, but it's interesting because he leaves out to keep thee in all thy ways. See, that when the devil quotes Scripture, when the devil brings out a version of God's Word, he'll take things out. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. <laughs> now what's Jesus Christ do in response? Verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Did you know that that offer is still good today? Yes. And the devil offers that to men and women. I'll be politically correct. Okay? Still there. You worship the devil, he'll give you the kingdoms. Verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written... Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. How many times did Jesus Christ use the written word? Three. How many times did he plead the blood? Zero. Hmm. Very interesting. God's written word is the most powerful thing on this planet. Ephesians chapter 6. You say, well, that's Jesus. You know, that, that was Jesus. He couldn't plead the blood because the blood was in him. You know, and it's the kind of thing that you're going to get. <clears throat> All right, well, we'll go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Doctrine written for a Christian in the church age. We're going to see what we are supposed to use. They say about in battle prayers and spiritual warfare. Okay, let's talk about battle prayers and spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, lowercase w, it's the written word. Verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Where was pleading the blood? It's not in there. Not part of the armor. Not part of your offensive warfare weapons. It's not in there. The only time that blood is mentioned is there in verse 12 that says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Talking about people. Flesh and blood. Like we have here. Your enemies are not flesh and blood. Your enemies are not the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds and whatever else. Those guys are being used of Satan. But the point is they're not the real enemies. It's a spiritual war. And the way you fight the spiritual war is with what's mentioned here in Ephesians chapter 6. And pleading the blood's not in there. It's not there. Is there power in the blood? Yeah. To forgive you of your sins, past, present, and future. That takes power. Okay? It was God's blood that was shed there on the cross. All right? It pays for your sins. But you can't use that and try to make it into some witchcraft thing where you're casting it at people and using it as a spell type of a deal. That's dangerous. And I'll just say, I was kind of half fallen for the thing because I never looked into it. And if I ever parroted it, if I ever said it in any of my sermons, I will hear before God and before man take it back. <laughs> okay? It's not scriptural to do this pleading the blood thing. It's just not in there. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Two more places to turn to and then we're done. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. One of those key scriptures that you need to know. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 
this book is powerful. Okay? And there are times, you know, I've seen videos, a guy has a real sharp sword, and he'll slice at something, and you think, oh, he missed it. But you look in just a minute or two, and the thing falls over. And there are times when you're going to be dealing with a lost person, and they're going to blast you, make fun of you, or something like that, and you're going to say, well, you know what? The Bible says that every knee shall bow. And they'll go, ah, you know, whatever, and they'll walk away. And they don't look like they've been cut, but they have been. Okay? You might not be able to see the spiritual cut in them. Okay? You might not be able to see them repenting, having some sorrow come into their life. They might laugh at you and mock you, but they've been cut. Okay? Don't ever get to a point where you try to use your own power and your own things that aren't even scriptural, like this pleading the blood thing. It's not what it's supposed to be. We're to know the Bible so well that we can use Scripture against any situation. And this book is where the power's at. Okay, one place to turn to and then we're done. First Peter chapter 4. Now, will you suffer and be attacked as a Christian? According to that article there, they said no. But according to the Bible, First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Here's some real good instruction in righteousness. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be something to get up there to heaven and have nothing in common with the Lord Jesus and with the martyrs and with the saints? They're sitting around saying, yeah, I remember what that was like at that night that I was killed. I remember that. I remember being led out there and the people were mocking me and laughing at me and spitting on me. And and Jesus is there going, yep, I know, <laughs> you know. And I remember they took me to the stake and they gave me one last chance to recant. And I said, nope, not going to do it. And you and you know the modern Christians are and they go, yeah. I remember the one time somebody made fun of me at work. <laughs> oh. Boy, I was hurt. I went to counseling for a while. You know, it was rough. And I it, somebody took my credit card, you know, and it was it was horrible. They impersonated me and I had a horrible time, you know. That's not suffering for Jesus Christ. Whatever you go through in this life, keep eternity in mind. You know, it could get rough here. You know, it will get rough eventually in America. I don't know how much we're going to have to go through. I have no idea. You know, I teach a pre-tribulation rapture. I don't teach it because I'm a sissy and I think, you know, I'm going to use it to get out of any trouble coming. We might have some major trouble coming. I don't know. I hope, honestly, I hope that we can go on preaching the gospel up until the rapture. I hope the Lord leaves the doors open and there's plenty of opportunities to get people saved, plenty of opportunities to get the truth to people. That'd be great. But if it doesn't happen, if I end up having to be killed for the Lord, okay. I'm not going to try to, you know, I'll plead a, a bloodline around the house here so nothing bad happens to me. I'm going to go out and pray over each of the vehicles after we're done here with the service so nobody has an accident on the way home. Let me, let me say something else too. How many times has something bad happened in your life as a Christian and it later turned out to be positive? Many. Yeah. yeah. But according to this charismatic nonsense, you just plead it the blood and you, you cast the spells and then nothing bad ever comes to you. That's not the kind of relationship the Lord wants to give you. Sometimes you have to have some bad things happen to you. Sometimes you have to have sickness. Sometimes you have to have death in your family. Sometimes you have to lose your car or your finances or whatever because the Lord is directing your path. So that's going to be it for this study. Do not fall for this thing. You know, there are so many things out there today that get you off of where you're supposed to be as a Christian. So many things that sound big and impressive and neat, you know, and and to be able to have power over devils and I won't have to suffer. You know, that appeals to people. But it's not backed up by Scripture. Okay? I can't stress it enough. You need to know this book. So that if you do run into bad situations, you can pull it out and you can say, it is written. It is written again. It is written. It's the way it's supposed to be. 
So that's going to be it for this morning. Uh, thank you for listening.